What's up? Doc Mike. Public Health on Call. By Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Today's topic for September 20, 2020. Curating COVID-19 Research, the Novel Coronavirus Research Compendium. Thank you, Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Welcome to Season 2 of Public Health on Call, a podcast from the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. I'm Joshua Sharfstein, Vice Dean for Public Health Practice and Community Engagement, and a former Secretary of Maryland's Health Department. Our goal is to bring scientific evidence and experience to the public health news of the day through informative interviews with scientists, community leaders, policy experts, public health officials, clinicians, and more. If you have ideas or questions for us to cover, please email us at publichealthquestion at jhu.edu. That's publichealthquestion at jhu.edu for future podcast episodes. Today, Stephanie Desmond talks to Dr. Kate Grabowski, a Johns Hopkins epidemiologist, about an effort she is part of combing through and translating the piles of new COVID-19 research to help those on the front lines do their jobs better. Let's listen. Kate Grabowski, thanks so much for joining me. Thanks for having me. I'm really excited to be here today. So talk to me today about the NCRC, the Novel Coronavirus Research Compendium that you are uh, working on at Johns Hopkins. Sure. Yeah. So the NCRC, or the Novel Coronavirus Research Compendium, is a literature curation effort uh, by over 50 faculty here at the Johns Hopkins University and collaborating institutions, including Boston University, Vanderbilt, um, and Imperial. So the literature uh, reviews, what does that mean? Tell us. So basically, let me just start by why we started the NCRC in the first place. So as many of you may be aware, there's been this huge deluge of COVID-related publications since the beginning of the pandemic. We have thousands of papers um, coming out about COVID every week. And What we realize is that this information is of varying quality. Most of it is, you know, is is not great. There are some really amazing articles and it's hard for people to kind of pick through that, you know, the ocean of information that they're getting uh, with limited time, particularly people who are working on the front lines of the public health response. And so our effort was really um, in response to this problem. And so what we've done is we formed this group of uh, 50 uh, faculty, students, um, and postdoctoral associates uh, to basically comb through the literature in eight different public health areas of of relevance to the COVID response. Every, Every week, we're doing this review of all the articles that are coming out and then finding the most exciting research and the newest information that's gonna that's gonna really add to the conversation. We're reviewing that information and we're summarizing it and putting it on a website for everyone to see and use. Mm-hmm. And I guess you're sort of helping people who are working in public health figure out what pieces of information they need to know to move forward. Exactly, right? Because it's so hard. You do a search for COVID-19 and PubMed, and you're going to be pulling up maybe 10,000 articles at this point. You know, no one who's working on the front lines right now doing all the really hard stuff, Um, you know, contact tracing, uh, setting up public health and testing programs. Nobody has time to read all that literature. And so we're, we're actually combing through those thousands and thousands of articles and um, finding the highest quality information, summarizing it, including its limitations, because even high quality studies have limitations sometimes. And then we're, we're giving you what our final take is on the piece and how it adds to the, to the literature and what we already know. Mm-hmm. What are, would you say maybe one or two really important pieces that you were able to really help people understand all the nuance of that maybe perhaps the media out there reporting is giving a different picture? Yeah, so there's obviously been a number of, of articles um, that have been controversial that have come up in the media. Some, you know, we've been able to catch the limitations immediately. I think, you know, the earliest hydroxychloroquine paper um, on the patients in France uh, that was published as a preprint is probably a really good example um, of a paper that had so many limitations. It was impossible to know even where to start with that article. 
And so that article was actually later, um, unfortunately, retracted uh, in part because of those limitations. There was another uh, study that was published uh, in the proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences on an airborne transmission as the dominant mode of transmission. That study had numerous limitations, which the media did not pick up on. So it was kind of widely circulated. It was on CNN. You know, it was, it was pretty much everywhere. Um, and very prominent people were tweeting about it. Uh, and when we had done the review, it was clear to us that there were really serious problems, which kind of highlighted like why you need to read papers or have kind of trusted reviews um, before you start tweeting about something or sharing it, you know, to a broader audience. Uh, so, so that was another paper. Um, that paper we actually formally called for a retraction for that paper. Some of us who are part of the NCRC formally called for a retraction along with 50 or so other epidemiologists from universities across the United States. And what did the paper say? Could you let us know? So that paper basically said that airborne transmission was the dominant route of COVID-19 transmission. And it had also made statements about masks, which of course are very useful. We should all be wearing masks. Um, but the evidence that they were using to support their claims on the effectiveness of masks were, you know, it was, it didn't really hold up under scrutiny. So yeah, so we were, we reviewed that, that paper, we found numerous methodological errors, we found some incorrect statements. We have documented that in detail, both on the NCRC website, but have also written a paper that kind of lays out all that information in detail. So that's just one example. So most of the studies that appear in big name journals are peer reviewed before they're published. How come those processes are not catching these issues? First of all, peer reviewers are human. Um, we don't, you know, there's only a few people that are reviewing a paper at any given time. And it's inevitable that there are going to be mistakes. There are retractions that will happen as a result of that or corrections to publications. That's part of the scientific process. And everybody should feel comfortable and happy that that happens. Uh, so I just want to make clear that we recognize that it's an imperfect system. And as scientists, we're all okay with that. We expect that to happen. So that should be no reason for the, for the public to ever feel distrustful of science. It should actually make you feel more trustful because we're kind of a self-correcting organization here. Um, so, so with that, yeah, there are definitely times where errors or mistakes get through. I think in the times of COVID where things are being really rapidly reviewed, uh, it might be the case that that is happening more frequently, although we haven't really seen any evidence for that. Some people have, have suggested that that might be a reason why we see retractions. I would say that we see retractions and corrections all the time. So, so yeah, so that's, that's one of the reasons. I, I will say for the PNAS article that I mentioned earlier, that paper actually went through a separate, they have a, what's called a contributor track process. So these are people who are members of the academy that can uh, submit their own articles, and then they actually choose their own reviewers to review the article. So um, that was kind of a unique peer review case, and I wouldn't say follows the typical typical paper process. Mm -hmm. So um, I know that obviously COVID is such a unique situation, and you have so many people interested in finding ways to get us through this and out of this uh, situation. I wonder if also you're seeing a lot more just interested people reading these studies and they're making their own comments and they're tweeting about them. Is that part of why we need something like this curation effort? Yeah, I think there's definitely a lot of what we would call armchair epidemiology uh, going on. There are people outside their fields of expertise making claims about articles um, uh, and what they mean all the time. You know, that is definitely part of the reason why we started this effort. Um, again, a, a, there's a huge volume of research that, that needs to be kind of whittled down into what's most important because people don't have time. Um, and again, like our main focus is on getting the information to the people who are responding. But also um, one of our other main um, primary reasons for doing this is because there's been a lot of just people who are promoting research that they may not know, you know, is this a good study or not, um, that may not have the expertise. And we wanted people to, to have a trusted resource for, for looking at reviews rather than just saying, okay, I'm gonna go onto social media and see what people are saying about the latest research. 
uh, we wanted to provide them with a more trusted resource. Mm -hmm. Because we're seeing a lot of misinformation out there. We're seeing a lot of, as you said, armchair epidemiologists just sharing their views on things. That must complicate the situation. Yeah, sure. I mean, it definitely complicates things. I am not sure how, I think, I think to some extent this is always happening. We're just seeing it on a much, (laughs) you know, it's, it's a much bigger scale than what normally is going on. Um, you know, and people are obviously care about COVID probably more than any other public health problem that we can think of in the recent past, um, just because of how disruptive it is. So you're just going to, by nature, see a lot of folks sharing research and, a a variable quality to kind of support whatever point there is um, that they may have. So yeah, so there is a lot of misinformation. I just want to say though that there's a lot of really great information and great studies that are coming out there too. And we are really trying to highlight those studies as part of our efforts as well. Mm -hmm. Well, I think this whole um, notion of trusted sources, I mean, that's just so much more important than ever before, is really paying attention to where the information is coming from, which is why a a service like yours, there's a lot of room for it. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I would agree with that. So um, I wanted to ask you one more question about sort of the curation efforts that are out there. I guess you guys are really finding lots of new and interesting studies that might not otherwise get attention. Yeah, so there are a ton of uh, tools that are being developed to curate literature, put literature into different bins or topics and and summarize it on a weekly basis. Okay, these are the articles that came out under the bin of epidemiology, or these are the articles that came out under the bin of diagnostics or whatever topic. But where we kind of stand apart is that we're actually going through all of those articles and deciding, okay, like, you know, there's some subjectivity to our process, which I can talk to you a little bit about, Um, but we're actually deciding, okay, like, what is, you know, what's new, what's novel, and how does this add to what we already know? And that's really hard to do with, you know, artificial intelligence algorithms that some groups are using. Um, You need people who are experts in the top to be able to to really kind of hone in on the most exciting stuff. And I think that's where we really add to the the discourse. Kate Grabowski, thank you so much for joining me. Thanks, I'm so happy to be here. Public Health On Call is produced by Joshua Sharfstein, Lindsay Smith-Rogers, Stephanie Desmond, and Lamari Morales. Audio production by Spencer Greer, Niall Owen McCusker, Cian Oates, and Matthew Martin, with support from Chip Hickey. Distribution by Nick Moran.